Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit interesting. This is about the uncanny, uncanny valley theory of human evolution. So uh, I'm kind of familiar with this where we're afraid of something that looks human but isn't human. That might be able to make us go crazy in many ways. So um, I always found this concept to be interesting because at one point in Earth's prehistoric history, we weren't alone. There were others, other humans, other creatures. They were very brutal, very monstrous, some very gentle. But then again, you know, hey, you know, uh, it, it was an interesting time. We weren't alone in the universe. There were other hominids on the planet. So uh, this is from North O2. So let's enjoy this video and get our learn on, folks, in a three, two, and an uno and out. Let's go, Ghostbusters, and enjoy this video. Some faces feel wrong. Not monstrous, not alien but just close Ugh. enough to human to be terrifying. You know the moment <laughs> when you see it, something's off. And before your brain can even explain it, your body already knows. This isn't right. Psychologists call it the uncanny valley, a deep-rooted fear of things that look human, but aren't. Why would we have evolved such a strong reaction to- Oh, God, okay, that would freak me out. Faces that are almost <laughs> human. Our brains are ancient, shaped in a world of predators and prey, long before machines or movies. So what if this reaction comes from somewhere older? What if it was the last trace of a time when the world wasn't just home to Homo sapiens, other species that looked human but weren't? Some we lived alongside, some we bred with, and some we fought. Yeah, humanity wins. Maybe the uncanny valley is more than just an odd quirk, and today we will be breaking it down. The idea of the uncanny valley was first described by Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori in the 1970s. He noticed that the more human-like a robot became, the more people felt empathy for it, at first. But as it crossed a certain line, something strange happened. Instead of empathy, people felt discomfort, revulsion, even fear. The robot- I, Yeah, I don't like this whole advancement of artificial intelligence and AI and- uh, you know, it's like we didn't pay attention to Terminator, you know? It looked Terminator 1 and 2, and the first Matrix, and anything with the Men of Iron. Too human, but not quite right. The effect dipped into what Mori called the Valley of the Uncanny. And it wasn't just robots. People felt the same way about wax figures, prosthetics, and CGI characters that didn't quite capture life. Something about these faces, too close to humans, but subtly wrong triggered an automatic response. You don't have to think about it. It's instant. It's deep in the mind. And it begs the question, why would we have this instinct at all? Our ancestors didn't evolve alongside robots or movie monsters. Mm -hmm. The world was filled with wild animals, strange environments, and yeah. other humans. Yeah, you know, like saber-toothed cats, cave bears, giant crocodiles, giant baboons. Instincts this strong and universal don't arise by accident. They evolved because, at some point, they kept our ancestors alive. Think about the fear of snakes. Primates, including humans, are hardwired to fear serpents, and not without reason. In one fascinating study, researchers showed monkeys objects that only vaguely resembled snakes. Even these crude shapes triggered stress responses. Why? Because for millions of years, snakes were deadly predators. Any primate that failed to recognize the danger didn't survive to pass on its genes. Now ask yourself, could the uncanny valley be the same kind of ancient instinct? A warning system designed to help us recognize and fear other kinds of humans? Ones that looked like us, but weren't. Yeah, I'd be afraid. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can't trust them. The existence of this valley suggests that at some point in prehistory, there was a reason to evolve a fear of faces that were almost human. But what or who were we afraid of? For most of our evolution, we weren't alone. Modern humans, aka Homo sapiens, didn't appear on an empty earth. We emerged in a world already inhabited not only by other hominins, but distantly related lines. First of all, our ancestors were not always the dominant species. In fact, for a long time, they were prey more often than predators. If you think Africa is dangerous today, he wouldn't even believe the conditions that our ancestor Homo erectus lived through. There were massive saber-toothed cats ready yep. to pounce, territorial hippopotamus willing to tear you apart, and plenty of other terrifying creatures. 
especially that giant baboon creature. But we didn't just evolve alongside other animals. At this time, there were plenty of other hominids around. Our erectus ancestors would have encountered Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, close relatives but distinctly different. Mistaking a group of habilis as your family while returning from a hunt can be the last thing you ever do. But we also shared the landscape with very different lineages. Small-bodied Australopithecines were still around two million years ago. These guys were pretty weird looking, with brains the size of a chimpanzee but standing completely upright. Imagine after a long day of hunting, you are taking a rest while your children play nearby. You take a glimpse to check on them, but you notice a slim figure luring your child. Oh! Oh no! Oh, that would freak me out! Ah! Child away. Before you can even get your spear, the nimble creature grabs your child and runs off into the night. If you think it's scary being a parent in the modern day, our ancestors may have had to deal with literal child predators as in they probably consumed our young. Other species like Paranthropus may have been more passive observers of our day-to-day -day lives. Some researchers have likened them to the cows of the human lineage, built for eating mass quantities of plant matter. They may not have preyed on our children, but their presence must have been eerie. They walked upright and were clearly related to us, but their proportions were just off. Massive jaws, sloping foreheads, and small and wiry bodies Nah. I don't trust them. Kill them. For a clear reminder, they were not us. But they weren't the only ones. Other, even more distant apes prowled the Pleistocene landscape. Let's not forget about the ancestors of chimpanzees and gorillas. We only have a few fossils from the ancestors of these species, some of which are found in East Africa. This means we would have undoubtedly crossed paths with them countless times. And while they may seem timid today, partially due to poaching and human technology, I doubt they feared us two million years ago. Moving on, there were other primates in Africa. Oh, that's one. The baboon. Africa that looked like they came straight out of hell. The giant baboon like Dinopithecus was truly nightmare fuel. They had massive canines, and large males could even weigh over 170 pounds. Imagine their giant quadrupedal stance, fangs glistening with spit. Words cannot describe how terrifying it would have been to come across an aggressive troop of these animals. Another terrifying animal was Theropithecus. This genus actually survives in a smaller form in the Ethiopian highlands, but during the time of Erectus, they were much larger. In some cases, large males could even weigh up to 160 pounds. And keep in mind, most Homo erectus males were probably only around 130 to 140 pounds. But though these animals were fearsome, we actually have evidence that Homo erectus may have been targeting their young as prey at one site. Why would you do that? Check out this video next. This goes to show you that we were not passive actors. Our ancestors undoubtedly partook in the brutal world that raised them. Homo erectus, one of our earliest ancestors, undoubtedly encountered many hominids and primates that were uncanny. But now let's fast forward hundreds of thousands of years later. Our species, Homo sapiens, is on the rise, mm. but we are still not alone. In Africa, we lived alongside Homo naledi, a species with a strange mix of primitive and modern traits. We don't have evidence we interbred with them, despite living alongside them for hundreds of thousands of years. As of 2025, we have only found their remains in a single cave system in South Africa. The weird little hominins may have even placed their dead in the cave as a sort of burial practice. Moving west, we encounter another hominid species, but we haven't found any of their fossils. We only know of them from the DNA of modern West Africans. The goat's lineage interbred with West Africans possibly as late as 50,000 years ago. We still have a lot to learn about this hominid and hopefully we'll get some fossil evidence soon. When our species- No, it's, I mean, it's, it's rather fascinating that we were able to survive all of this and deal with these different species of humans, but on the other hand, too, it, man, Earth must have been really crazy back in the day. You know, giant megafauna, other hominids, titans walk the Earth. She's actually left Africa, the world only grew stranger. To the north and west, we encountered Neanderthals. They possessed extreme strength, though also intelligence. We have a long and storied history with Neanderthals. 
Our species first met in Western Asia over 100,000 years ago. As our species continued to spread into Europe, we gradually assimilated with the Neanderthals. These early European modern humans kept Neanderthal features for a long time, but much of them were eventually bred out of the population. As you can see on this map, Europeans retain less than 2% Neanderthal DNA on average, while Asian populations have a little more. But Asia was also home to another species, the Denisovans. This species has proven to be one of the most enigmatic of them all, but we finally discovered a skull of their species, so go check out that video next. Moving further into Southeast Asia, we met the tiny Homo floresiensis, the so-called hobbits, and Homo luzon- Ugh, stupid hobbitses. Always doing anything, taking my precious. Onensis, another small-bodied species. Despite all the differences we had with all these other species, we didn't just fear them. We know for a fact that modern humans interbred with at least three other species, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and a third ghost hominid in Africa. So what does this mean for the Uncanny Valley? If the instinct evolved to protect us from these other humans, why would we also be drawn enough to them to interbreed? Could this explain- Ugh, and then this is gonna lead to the sex robots, trust me on it. My faces that are almost human spark such complex reactions, a mix of fear and fascination? Well, there are a couple of hypotheses which could explain the nuances of the Uncanny Valley. Each traces back to deep survival needs. The first is disease avoidance. In a world with no medicine, no doctors, and no understanding of germs, disease could sweep through small bands of humans in days. Outsiders may have been seen as dangerous, possibly carrying with them evil spirits. Funny enough, we actually inherited genital herpes, likely from Pranthropus over two million years ago. Oh! Could this have been an example where our in- All right, who, who, who stuck their wang bone inside a, a Pranthropus hom hominid? Or, 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 or who was messing around, fooling around? These things failed us? Recognizing even subtle signs of illness could mean the difference between life, death, and herpes. Pale skin, odd eyes, jerky, unnatural movements, even a slight change in the way someone held themselves. These were clues that something was wrong. And what is a corpse but the ultimate source of infection? A dead body is still eerily human, but devoid of life. That brings us to the second idea, identifying the dead. For ancient humans, the presence of the dead could mean danger, disease, or predators. Recognizing the death of your kin quickly would have been crucial. Our brains may have evolved to detect the fine. Hey, I mean, maybe that explains why a lot of us react so emotionally to Walking Dead or zombie movies, you know? Like, oh, the dead are walking. Nine between life and death, and to react to anything that falls near that line. Faces that look alive but not quite trigger the same alarms. That's why horror movies use pale, lifeless skin and unnatural movement to terrify us. It taps straight into that ancient instinct. But there is a third idea, one that brings us back to those uncanny, shadowy figures in the forest. Enemy recognition. For hundreds of thousands of years, our ancestors didn't just face leopards, hyenas, or saber-tooths. They faced other humans. Some were rival bands of Homo sapiens, others were Neanderthals, Denisovans, or late surviving Homo erectus. Close enough to fool the eye, but different enough to trigger caution. Distinguishing us from them wasn't just about skin color or clothing. It was about reading the face, the walk, the expression. Who is my enemy? Especially when the stakes were life and death. A Neanderthal stepping into your hunting ground, an Australopithecus lurking near your children. Was this a friend, a potential mate, a killer? The uncanny valley may have evolved as a finely tuned warning system an instinct to instantly assess faces that were almost human, but not quite. It may have helped ancient humans react to the very real danger of other hominins. And this would explain why the feeling is so immediate. You have to wonder, could this instinct have been responsible for the extinction of every other species of human? It is possible. Everywhere we went, extinction followed for all the local hominins. Though we did breed with some of them, this may have only happened occasionally. Even today, humans have the tendency to meet the other with hostility. And maybe this is what happened to the other species of humans. So where does this leave us today? In the modern world, we rarely encounter the kinds of dangers that shaped our ancient minds. Most of us will never fight for food or territory. 
we no longer share the Earth with Neanderthals or Tenisovans. And yet, that fear remains. You can feel the presence of another in a dark room even when no one is there. You pick up on subtle clues in wax museums and horror movies. It's the same jolt, the same instinct, ancient and untouched by time. Perhaps it is one of the remnants of a prehistoric world filled with threats we can barely imagine. A world where humans weren't alone, where seeing another upright figure in the dark might mean death or worse. And maybe that's why this fear lingers, because long ago, it kept us alive. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the eerie side of human evolution, hit that like button. Also, drop a comment below telling me what you think of the Uncanny Valley. Don't forget. All right. Well, what can we take away from this? Uh, well, uh, okay. I find it interesting because here's the thing. At the end of the day, it was all these terrors that was around in the fossil record, you know, saber-toothed tigers, cave lions, uh, giant short-faced bears, um, woolly mammoths, mastodons. Yes, I know they're herbivores, but come on, they're dangerous animals too. Megafauna, um, Neanderthals, and other different types of hominids, you know. I mean, to us, like, boy, you know, the, the chips are against us, but in all reality, you know, we're still here talking and looking at this while we comfortably sit in our rooms watching this on the YouTubes or on the cameras or on any kind of smartphone device or laptop, we won. We won. At the end of the day, we won. We beat all the other hominids. We beat all the mega super predators. We survived them. We beat them. Now, they had strength and power on their side, but brute force was nothing against cunning tactics and stratagems. Perhaps the Uncanny Valley is more of maybe of our own self-fear of what we did to the others. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. It's a reflection of what we, perhaps looking as friendly people, have done to those who perhaps maybe were not the villain or the enemy. Again, you know, that's a speculation because, you know, at the end of the day, those hominids and Neanderthals and other species were competing for the same resources we were. And, you know, the whole world was a different type of environment. But guess what? It's still a hostile world out there. There's a lot of predators and monsters and villains out there. Be careful out there, folks. Drink water and keep your heads on a swivel, as you should.